now, everybody, just as you've come back to us, we greet you with the news that some of those Thompson's gazelles you're looking at have lost a cousin. He jumped into the water prematurely and he was devoured by the character that we first developed here in the Mara Triangle, that of the gormless crocodile who failed to catch any wildebeest the first time we watched 10 or, well, about 200 of them run over his head. He did, however, have absolutely no trouble whatsoever nailing one of those little fellows. Now, since we last saw you, there's been a very large collection of wildebeest gathering on the northern bank there, as you can see, and they're heading towards that other herd, which is still standing rather, well, indecisively, should I say, on the side of the river. And maybe this lot coming over the hill will exert sufficient pressure, but you know, it's actually completely impossible to predict what these things are going to do and when they're going to do it. So, we're just going to sit here and enjoy the spectacle and the experience of being on the great plains of East Africa where our human ancestors, of course, first stood on two legs. It really is just too special to be here. And there has been quite a lot of rain, like I said, and you can see quite a lot of sort of grayish cloud above us. Now, Debbie, you're in Vancouver, and it's lovely to talk to you. We've obviously talked to you from the Sabi Sunt before, while Jean-Dre pans over the burgeoning clouds of this Mara Serengeti ecosystem. If you want to know about the crocodiles, I'm just going to move out the way so that you can see the one that is still eating below us there. There he is. And you still see him, Jean-Dre. And you want to know if they're territorial, they are not over food though, often they will share carcasses. I mean, I've seen pictures and some, sometimes even live, of pictures of sort of three or four or five crocodiles and sometimes up to 10 or 20 on one carcass. So they're not territorial about their food. So they don't have one carcass per crocodile like you say. I think you'll find that the only reason there's only one crocodile eating this one is that the rest of the crocodiles are so full. This time of year for them is a time of absolute glut. And the same goes, you know, for many of the lions. We've seen a lion killed today, believe it or not, and I know that uh, will make many of you jealous and uh, you will be turning green with envy where you're sitting now, but don't worry, we'll hopefully get you another one. And uh, the reason I say that, of course, is because at this time of the year, the lions are doing a lot of killing, and then half the time they don't even finish their carcasses. So we watched an orphaned wildebeest be chased down by a lioness today, and it's interesting, we'd been watching this wildebeest we think it was the same one. He'd been orphaned for two days. We'd driven past him a couple of times and he'd been with a herd of zebra. And somehow he'd separated from them today. And he'd sort of joined with a small herd of elephants and then he left them too. And he ran sort of within 700, meet, uh, 700 feet of this lioness and lion who we followed last night. And she stood up and she slunk into a gully. And he picked her up on the wind, I think, and he turned on and he started to run. And it was amazing. His little legs were running as fast as they could take him. And the lioness, just in those incredibly long, fluid, cat-like strides, caught him. And the little fellow turned around as the last ditch sort of attempt uh, to stop her. And she didn't stop for one breath. She turned around, or she just carried on going. She pulled him down. So that's what we saw just as we drove out of camp today. And of course, there's an enormous amount of luck to this, but the point is that she and the male had eaten last night and yet they still chose to kill and they could well do it again tonight and the night after that and that just because there's so much food over here at the moment. That's not always the case and certainly if you talk about the lions down on the southern plains of Ser the Serengeti, apparently just before calving time, just before the wildebeest make their way back there, they're emaciated and starving. So it's not always times of good that they make hay while the sun doth shine, jean -Dre. Let's find out what's going on the other side there, shall we? Sorry, I gave you a very poor direction there. There we are. jean -Dre and I are just getting used to each other standing in this Land Rover. We are standing on the seats, moving to and fro across them, daintily like little fairies. Well, jean is not a very little fairy at all. He's enormous, enormous calves like moving around in a car with a hippopotamus. Speaking of which, there are many of them over here. There we are.
Hello, Monique in London. You say, do the crocs and hippos ever interact with each other? They do, not very friendlily though. They don't have each other over for dinner. That's normally because they have a very different taste in cuisine, of course. Crocodiles go for rotting wildebeest, hippo go for grass. Um, but they tolerate each other to a certain extent. A crocodile will be very reticent of going anywhere near a big hippopotamus. Um, and if they've got a very small hippo, then the crocs will sometimes go towards them. Um, but then the mother or one of the big bulls will chase the crocs away. So no, they really don't, they don't get a huge amount of tolerance from the hippos. So that's the state of play. If you've just joined us right now, what we're hoping is going to happen, one of the great wildlife spectacles the world has to offer, a Mara crossing of wildebeest. And if we look off to the left-hand side there, you can see that that herd, indecisive as it is, is moving slightly closer down towards the river. And they're hopefully starting to feel the pressure of the rest of this bunch coming up from the other side. And I don't know, I mean, I think they're probably, what would you say, Jandri, about mm, two, a thousand wildebeest here? I'm getting head shrugs from everybody in the vehicle. So there no everyone's hedging their bets. I think about a thousand of them. Oh, 927, I'd say. Graham says 927 of them, so I'm glad we were almost right, everybody. Um Arcadia, I'm afraid I missed your question. I was listening to um I was listening to Makulu Bas telling us uh, exactly how many wildebeest there are here. Um, yes, Acadia, you're absolutely correct. You say, do the crocodiles kill the wildebeest as they cross and then leave them to rot and then eat them as they rot? Yes, they do. If this is a very small animal, they'll be able to kind of snap a bone like that and swallow it and it'll be very delicious for them, I'm sure. But often what they do is drag them underneath a rock and they'll leave them to rot there for a while and that rotting flesh will sometimes attract other crocodiles. But then, you know, eventually as with a good, any good stew, the meat will just sort of fall off the bone and that's what the crocodiles want. They don't have the ability to chew. They can snap things. They've got the most powerful bite out here. Um, but it's not, uh, it's not sort of chewing motion. They can snap their, snap their jaws shut very quickly and you know, snap bones, but it's very difficult for them to actually chew bones. So they've got to wait for the flesh to rot. Thank you, Acadia, for that. But of course, because they are reptiles and they don't have a... They're poikilothermic, so they don't have to produce their own heat to live. It means their met metabolic rate is that much slower than it would be for a mammal. And because it's that much slower than it is for a mammal, they can afford to wait for their food to rot before they eat it. Fantastic stuff. And I'll just give you a little bit of an idea of the birds as well. I know many of you are keeping a bird list. Let's try and keep a Mara bird list too. And I'll tell you some of the things we might be very lucky to see here. We could see the purple grenadier, a lovely sort of waxbill type bird that is quite common. When I first saw one, I thought I had hit a bird gold, as it were, uh, but they seem to be relatively common. Then the rupel's vulture is the one you want to see, the rupel's griffin vulture. Looks much like the white-backed ones we see in the Sabi sand. A lovely red beak, though. Not red, it's yellow. Yellow beak. Beautiful. Okay, we're going to still wait here for a little while longer and see what happens. There's some more zebra coming up over the hill there. While we do that, please give my very best regards to the little Nkahuma cubbies. Right, everybody, it looks like those zebras might think about crossing. Now, that is a very small group of zebras to be crossing, but you can see. Well, I don't know if you can or not, but uh, I used to be a horseman. Them horses look pretty suspicious to me, and so they're thinking about whether or not there is a dinosaur of the deep waiting for them. Now I'm just going to focus this rather vast camera. There is Mr. Gorman's crocodile, Jandre. I have spotted him. Now, um, you obviously are just, uh, you can see the bush here, Jandre. Down below that, there is something that looks like a floating log, but is not. No. Tell me when you have it. Um, you've got him. Right, there he is, everybody. I mean, it may well not be the gormless crocodile, but it could easily be. Uh, he is a monstrous crocodile, probably about nine feet long.
maybe even more. And he's waiting there. The zebra know he's there, and some, for some reason, you know, they're, they're drawn towards the water, these animals, and despite the risk, eventually they plunge in and they go for it. Now, what I'm going to ask Jandri to do once he's finished with the gormless crocodile is to come over this way and show us these wildebeest now moving down towards there. And I'm going to keep an eye on the zebra because one of them is coming back towards the water now. Jandri, of course, getting used to filming these indecisive animals. There we go, back down at the river. It all does point towards some kind of action happening here at some stage, I must say. So it's definitely going to be worth our while sitting here for the course of this afternoon. We do have five afternoons here after all. And once the sun doth set over the edge of the Ulololo escarpment, sorry, that's Olololo, Olololo escarpment, uh, then we'll go and find the lions and spend some time with them. Ah, now Kay, you want to know how deep the Mara is. You say you don't know if it's been mentioned. It hasn't been mentioned, Kay. So fear not, you have not missed anything. Jandri, can we go back to the hippopotamus over there? And you'll see, Kay, that they are out of the water and they're standing. They don't swim a great deal. They do quite a lot of standing and they're most certainly on the ground there. Now, a hippopotamus, adult bull, probably stands about four and a half feet at the shoulder. They're not covered there. So I suspect that particular area is, well, not nearly as deep. But as you come towards us, Jandri, I think that channel there is probably quite deep. I don't think it gets much deeper than six feet. So I would say six feet at this stage in the deep channels and then opening out to a much kind of shallower three or four feet where there aren't any rapids and then where the rapids, of course, are and the river is wider, well, then a little bit shallower. Now, there the zebra are. They're having a drink. And this is often, you know, they just want to come down and have a drink. They don't necessarily wish to cross the river. It is the most stunning afternoon. There does seem to be a bit of a cloud burgeoning off towards the east there, which is slightly terrifying. We were caught in some rain yesterday, which resulted in quite a lot of bad language from a number of us as we tried desperately to get the roofs back onto the vehicle and Jandre then stood with a bright red umbrella over the top of <laughs> the vehicle for the rest of the day. Now while we're watching these zebra just to let you know this is the Mara Triangle everybody a northeastern spit of land 510 square kilometers in extent that's 51,000 hectares about the same size as the Sabi sand and we are waiting here to see if this great group of wildebeest don't think about crossing the river. Now, we'll, um, I nearly called Jandre. I nearly called Jandre a wildebeest, everybody. Jandre, not wildebeest. Um, can you kindly go across? And you can see that that herd seems to have made a decision, but not necessarily a positive one for us. There. There's there. There's one there. Um, sorry, I, miss, I think, was it Kay? You wanted to know if this river is the boundary between the Serengeti and the Mara. Sorry, I'm missing that, Rebecca. You're going to have to go again. Tuhin. Tuhin, you want to know if this is the boundary between the Serengeti and the Masai Mara. It is not. It is the boundary between what we call the Mara Triangle and the Maasai Mara, and they're all part of the same system. But the Mara Triangle is a conservancy, well, quite a lot like the Sabi Sand, I suppose. It's not private landowners, but it is a, a board, a private board. And then the Maasai Mara is a national park, and that's the other side of the river. There's quite a lot going on there down by the drinking rivers there. 
As two wildebeest have made the plunge down towards the river, the gormless crocodile has sunk beneath the surface as he waits to see if his dinner is going to climb into the water. Now, as much of a blessing as rain is, everybody, you know it's not very good for safari, so we're going to hope that the sun remains out like it is now. Well, until it goes down, of course. Hello, Debbie. This is a lovely question. You say, what is so attractive on the other side of the river to make the animals want to take the danger and cross? Well, Debbie, we all know that the grass is greener on the other side of the river, and I don't mean that to be a slightly facetious answer. That is exactly what it is. It's a case of there being greener grass on the other side and them hoping to find some kind of uh, better food. And in this case, it's probably a bit irrational because it's rained both sides of the river. But there certainly seems to have been a lot of rain on this eastern side where we are now, sorry, the western side of the river. And that means, of course, that the grass is greener and so the animals are going to want to eat this grass and so they think about coming across. And it's got greener, you know. It rained the first night we were here. It rained the second night we were here. <laughs> it rained the third night that we were here. And this is the fourth night, and it looks like it's building now, but we'll see. But it definitely has put a green sheen over the top of the vegetation here, and in much the same way as many of you would have seen how quarantine turns quickly to a beautiful green sheen after a little bit of rain has formed, well, so it is here in the Mara Triangle. Now, from all these astounding animals to one that I have not seen here in the Mara Triangle, let's go and find out what it is with Taylor. I'm not going to talk to... Now we've left the crossing, everybody. The wildebeest seem to decide that they had no desire to any longer cross the river and brisk the dinosaurs of the deep. And here we are on this sort of marsh that comes away from the Mara River. The Mara River is going to turn eventually into lots and lots of little oxbow lakes and this is one of them forming. And in the background you can see a little elephant. It looks like a young bull, just recently separated from his herd, making his way on his own in this vast wilderness. And then we've got a whole lot of us different things here, and one of which I don't think any of you have seen. This might be a safari live first. We've got something called a defasa waterbuck. And instead of just having the ring around the bottom, they have got a great splodge of white fur. And that is how you distinguish the defasa waterbuck from the standard issue waterbuck that you've got down there in South Africa. There is another elephant. I've just seen it. Chandri, can you see it? There's between the two waterbuck over there, and he's just sort of just flapping the ears there. So maybe this young bull's not completely on his own. Then there are a couple of birds, some standard issue grey herons. I saw a black-headed heron here the other day. Oh, there they are. That little pair of birds standing next to each other, Jean-André, are black-headed herons. That you don't see in the Saabi sand. It's quite nice. And then we have a hammerkop off to the left-hand side. And the hammerkops, or well, one of its closest relatives, is a bird that we don't find, or well, is potentially found here, and one of the top birds I want to see, and that's a shoe bill, which is an enormous thing with a bill that looks like a shoe, a pointed shoe, a bit like the shoe of, um, I don't know, uh, one of those winkle pickers. Hello, Jeffrey in Texas. You said you thought you saw a quarry busted across the way there from the zebra. Um, I don't know if you get them here, Jeffrey. Uh, let me check for you quickly. I have an East African bird application. Rhonda, will you show us these things while I embarrassedly find out where you find, whether you find a... Oh, come on, here we are. Quarry busted here. 
will come shortly, everyone. Bustard. Corey Bustard. Map, yes. Jeffrey, they are found here. I don't think there was one next to the zebra that we were looking at, but it's possible that I missed it. Um, we are doing some amazing dancing around in this vehicle trying to avoid each other, Jean-Dre and I. I will let you know that Jean-Dre has taken his very large boots off. They take up most of the back of this car, although well, he has not small feet. Then, over there, we've got a very gorgeous, actually, sitting in this wonderful light, herd of buffalo. And look, just beyond them, the unbelievable view. There goes the DeFassa waterbuck, Mrs. DeFassa. Good evening to you. And beyond her, look at the plains of the most quintessential African scene you'll ever see. Now, many of you would have watched Out of Africa, that fantastic film with Meryl Streep and Robert Redford. My mother, by the way, is convinced my father looks like Robert Redford. He doesn't. Um, anyway, that's nothing to do with the DeFassa Waterbuck, but this is actually largely where they filmed the, the wildlife scenes in that show. And Dennis Fitchhatton was apparently buried not too far from here. Or well, there's a plaque in his honour. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, you're looking at the waterbuck, but just beyond it is just the most astounding view. You're looking sort of southwest now, and that's the Olololo escarpment on which we are staying. That's where we sleep. And so we look down into here every morning when we wake up, which is a great privilege. And one has to pinch oneself every time. And it's about 1,900 meters above sea level. That is almost, it's just over 6,000 feet above sea level. So it's very high. There's a little calf. And down where we are now is about 1,500 meters above sea level. So it's almost a mile high, everybody. And that makes the climate very delicious indeed. Coldest it gets is about 9 centigrade, which I think sits at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And the hottest is probably about 95 or so. And compared with the Sabi Sunt, which regularly goes over 100, it's just a little bit more pleasant climate-wise in the summer. Now, what we're going to do is something, it's another safari live first, is we're going to drive live towards those buffalo. I'm just going to quickly get myself into a position to make that possible. <coughs> you know, I never thought the day would come where I longed for Wendy and Rusty. But that day has arrived. John Ray, I think you feel the same. Oh, just quickly before we leave, though, John Dree, the two elephants have come out, and the light is just so unspeakably magnificent there. Isn't that gorgeous? That little woodland forest is in what will become an oxbow lake, an island in between this great winding river. That's just so beautiful. Mm. Sorry, I've missed that, Jesse. There's a nasty echo in my ear. Can we have it again, Becca? Oh, I see. You say that you can... You've heard that elephants can seek out water using their feet over a vast distance. They can... What I, Look, what they can do is feel flowing water under the ground. So, uh, well, I mean, as you know, on Cheetah Plains, they regularly dig up the pipes there. There's no artificial water in this area, though, and I'm not sure how much of it flows under the ground. So I think they'll probably find water here by remembering where it is. But absolutely, you know, those dry riverbeds of the Sabi sand, they can absolutely feel with their feet where the water is flowing under the water. So yes, it is possible, Debbie. Isn't that just the most gorgeous sight you've ever seen? I'm going to have to take a picture. 
Hello, Helene. You say this is so cool. I think this is beyond cool, isn't it? I, it's astounding that we're sitting here broadcasting from this particular area. I've wanted to come here for so very long and to be able to share it all with you who've experienced so many of my great wildlife highlights. Well, that's just a great honour and I hope you're enjoying it. We're shortly going to head off to where we last saw the lions and we'll see if we can't get a nice sighting of them as they get active and just before they will hopefully do something useful tonight like I say, there's so much for them to eat here that I'm not sure how much they're going to try and feed on today. Ah, now, what I would like you to all do, everybody, is take a very deep breath in. Close your eyes. And I'll tell you a little bit about what you should be smelling. There's a tremendously fresh smell because of the rain we've had here. There's not very much in the way of dust. And if you listen, very subtle sounds. Oh, Jandre. Sorry, I'm going to just see what I've spotted here. Very subtle sounds of water birds calling waterfowl. Now, for those of you who like to keep birdless, Jandre, that is absolutely brilliant. How did you see what I was looking at? There, there. <laughs> I saw it before you, James. <laughs> a grey-headed kingfisher. I'll sort him out later, everybody, don't worry. Isn't that lovely? That is just beautiful in this light. I'm not going to try and get up again, jean -Dre. I'm going to stay right where I am. Hello, James Richard. You were doing as I suggested, probably before I even suggested it. You're keeping a list of birds for the Mara, and you're excited to see how big it will be when we leave. Yes, me too. That one, of course, we do see, and we had a nest. Scott, the ultimate nest finder, found a nest of the grey-headed kingfisher on Arethusa. And it's nice to see them this side of the world as well. There's now this whole herd of elephant coming out into this glorious little seep of water. Let's see if we can find some other birds for you. We will go to those buffalo as well. Oh, this is just wonderful. Jandre, is the reason you've got such big muscles because you've um, carried such big lenses like I'm carrying now. Exactly. Mm, exactly, he says everybody, in case you missed that. He's taking this job very seriously, everybody. Every time anyone breathes in the back of the car here, he shouts at us. All right, we're going to head towards our lines, hopefully get to them around about sunset. While we do that, let's head across to Taylor, who apparently has found some water. To the Quechua Tembo Pride. This is one of the females, a youngster. We think she's just lost her cubs, and they're sitting here just as the sun goes down over the Olololo escarpment. To her right-hand side, one of the males, a marsh coalition. Now, many of you will have heard of the Marsh Pride, of course, having watched the and been fascinated by the big cat diaries well these males come from that pride and this female we think has lost her cubs like i say the three males this male and his two brothers have just come into this area they've taken over they've killed at least seven or at least five cubs there might be two left we're not sure at this stage but this female seems to be in an estrus now we saw that with the Uncahumas and the birminghams took over and what happens is, of course, they go into a false stage of estrus. When they lose their cubs, they urinate and they solidify a bond with the new males by mating with them. 
and I think that's what's going on here. We watched them courting yesterday evening, and you could very clearly see still she's got two swollen teats, so I think she's very obviously lost cubs very recently. So that's the first of the Kichwa Tembo Pride to introduce you to, and the first, of course, of the Marsh Coalition. Now, the Marsh Coalition of males is three, like I say. The other two, I think, are in the drainage line just below us here. I've missed her yawn every single time. Graham's going to be so cross with me. And you can see, here we go, very interesting stuff going on. Now, look at his mane. He's older than our Birmingham boys. I think he's probably about seven, this chap. He's not a young lion. He's got a very full mane. Why he's just taken over this area, we're not sure. Why not earlier? Where were they before this? And of course, this is the domain of the famous Scarface male lion. <laughs> this is just beautiful, isn't it? Look at that, everybody. The light's just gone, but that's okay. Now we get into the hunt. We think, well, they may lie down for the whole night, but they might do a little bit of hunting too. <laughs> He's exhausted. Now, these are the two we saw hunting today, everyone. We saw an amazing thing. This lioness killed that baby orphan wildebeest. Nasty lady. But she has to eat. And you can see they're in pristine condition. Now, if you want to learn how to identify this male lion, the best way to do it, of course, is to see that he has no pom-pom at all on the back of his tail. Watch as he flicks it to and fro, you will see. There we go, you see? It looks kind of like a snake almost without its pom-pom. So we'll call him no pom-pom. No, we don't have to call him that. <laughs> now many of these lions, of course, do not have names. In fact, they don't have names at all. And we know it's safari lions that in order to identify our special animals, we quite like to name them every so often. So if you would like to come up with some names, we can do that. She's got a spotty belly, so I'm going to suggest we call her Spotty Belly. I think we should perhaps call him something like a snake tail. It sounds very ominous indeed. Perhaps better than no pom-pom. What do you think, Chandra? Not too bad. Mm. And you can see also how golden she is. She really is the most gorgeous color. Now this grass, everyone, three days ago was that sort of, it wasn't brown, but it was very much straw colored rather than this green. And it's a little bit of rain that they've had here. I'm not sure how much it is exactly, but that's turned everything green. It's so exciting to introduce you to a new group of characters. And I hope during the course of the next little while, we will be able to introduce you to the rest of this pride. Certainly, we should be able to get the rest of the Marsh Coalition of Males. They are down just in this sort of drained stream, not too far from here. And maybe the other five lionesses. We have met only four of the lionesses so far. They were off hunting yesterday evening, and she kind of cut off from them and went off on her own and with him. And I, it was exactly, it was so interesting to see because it's exactly what happened when the Birminghams took over in the Sabi sand. One of the lionesses, and I think it was Amber Eyes initially, extracted from the rest of the pride. They didn't have cubs at the time, but of course the Birminghams had killed many lionesses. And so they were trying to solidify this bond. They were trying to reduce the conflict between the resident males and the females. And that's exactly what's happened here. Just stunning stuff. All right, John, I'm going to suggest that we ooze forward slightly and see if we can't look down into this drainage and just see. <coughs> Hello, Tasha Michelle. You say this lion is huge. How close are we? Um, he is big, but he's not unusually large. That's me in my in my in my cockpit, everybody. We're not going to drive long with this view. <laughs> Just go around the corner. Um, Tasha Michelle, he's about 
probably, I'd say, 20% larger than a Birmingham boy, but that's not because the lions of East Africa are any larger than the lions of the Sabi Sunt. It's because he's older. He's probably a year or um, maybe 18 months older than the lions of the, than those Birmingham boys. Now, but there are some cars in front of us. That's where they were lying earlier today. Just going to ease forward and break. Just go a little bit forward here. There seem to be a few people parked. John Drake, can you see me? Where then? Flash at three o'clock. Should we turn down? We managed to relocate on those elephants we had a little bit earlier. And they are just munching around in, in this little spot, as you can see. They haven't actually moved too far. Right, this is the next one, everybody. This is, I think we should call Blondy. He is blonder than the others. I stand to correction, but I think you can see that his mane is blonder. He has a complete tail, unlike the ones that the first chap that we saw that has no pom-pom on his tail at all. And then, you can see he's not doing a great deal. If we go off to the right-hand side there, Jandri, you can see the third of the Marsh Coalition of Males that recently taken over this area. There he is there. Doing what lions do very best of all in all the world, nothing. So that's them. Now, we've still got, of course, five lions of this pride to meet. We don't know if they're going to go hunting today. And you know what the interesting thing is, and we'll go back to what those other two lions now. The interesting thing is that so many things die here of natural causes. And indeed, as I said, I think when I was last time here, it's one of the major reasons we think that uh, bipedalism, which is what you and I do when we're walking around, developed or evolved because there's this massive food source in these plains that goes uneaten by scavengers because so much dies of natural causes. So these lions don't always have to kill, they scavenge quite a lot, but there's lots of fresh meat for them to eat too. Now, we're going to attempt one more drive. We're going to go down through this little drainage here, you can see, and we'll go back to the female and missing tail there, and we'll see what they're doing on top of that termite mound. Right, here we go. Now, Jesse, very good question. You want to know why it is, thank you, Jandre. Um, <laughs> you want to know, Jesse, why it is that sometimes lions don't kill um, prey if the prey doesn't run away. Well, it depends entirely on the prey, and certainly if you're a human being, what you try and do is, uh, when you see a lion on foot, you have to sit, stand very still, because what prey does, of course, is run away. Now, it, it's just like a cat. If something moves in front of a cat, the cat gets up and chases it, and it's the same with a lion. And it's exactly the same thing that happened to the little wildebeest. The first time the wildebeest ran away from the lions today, it turned and faced the lion, and the lion stopped because they don't really, they don't understand what that means. So, you know, they, they don't want to be hurt, they want to avoid any physical confrontation. And then when they turn on and run, turn their backs, that's when the lions realize, of course, that they had the advantage and they followed through. I hope that explains the answer. Now, all these other vehicles that are going past us now, unfortunately for them, have to leave the reserve. Goodbye, have a lovely dinner. We have got very special permission uh, to be in here after dark and so we'll see how long we're going to be here who knows how long it will be it could be till 10 30 in central african time it could be until much later than that let's see i'm just going to go around this car and we'll get another look at these lions on the top of this termite mound here there we are Chandra, i'm not convinced the top of my head is the best thing for these people to be looking at there we are we've got some lions now and we will be able to go off-road at some stage. Off-road driving is not hugely uh, fashionable in these parts, but we've got permission to do that too as night falls, and that's how we're going to follow these animals on the hunt.
Hello, Liz. You were interesting about how the sizes compare to our Nkahumas and Birmingham's. Liz, I think that you will find that the male is pretty much this well, he's a bit bigger because he's older, but I think he's no he's not necessarily larger. It's it's known, for example, the Kalahari lions um, tend to be a little larger than our Kruger lions, but these chaps look to be around about the same size, I reckon, as our Birmingham's. Um, I would put them at slightly smaller than the Matimbas. And then this female is small, but I think that's because she's young. I think she's probably just finished with her first litter. Oh, and the first litter unfortunately killed. And she's now making peace with the new masters of the area. Thank you for that, Liz. Quite a remarkable thing that we're able to do this from the Sabi Sands as well. And of course, our favourite in Kahuma's sitting there as we speak with their little cubs, which is just great. Now, let me stand up again. If you hear some grunting and groaning, it's my old bones. There we are. Oh, made it. Hello, everybody. Now, let's have a quick look at the Olulolo escarpment there. There, where Dennis Fitchhatton was uh, made dust to dust, as it were. On the back end of his adventures with Karen Blixen. And I'll just give you a little bit of a listen to, to this great East African sunset. interesting information we're getting through from the internet. Now, we've been trying very hard to find out what's going on with these lions. There seems to be a lack of clarity. And um, we've just had an interesting message from Karen. Um, thank you, Karen, for that, who's in turn receiving information from various sources. And that is that the, there are four marsh pride males. Um, and apparently, distinctively, that one without the tail is one of them. I'm going to, I don't know if that means that they're dominant over the marsh pride themselves, which occurs or lives, the territory certainly is bounded by the Mara River. Uh, why then, that, and Scar apparently is one of these four, why then they should have killed the cubs, I don't know. Um, that's very strange indeed, but we'll try and get a handle on this. And this is the great joy of being here right now, of course, is that we're able to try and figure out what's happening. As far as we're aware, these three males, well, I mean, we were told there were three males, um, have come into this area and have just taken over. But we'll try and find out and get some clarity as the evening goes on. Let's head back to South Africa and watch the southern sunset going down. I guess an African sunset can't be beaten. And I think for the moment we'll just sit in silence for a couple of seconds. We've got some action here, everybody. We've got roaring lions. These ones are not roaring right now, but she started roaring, and her, the brothers are now roaring from behind here. This is great stuff. As she roared, he stood up. That's another male behind us. He's marking territory as his brother calls from behind. It's going to be fascinating over the next five days to try and figure out what's going on here. Who's who in the zoo, as it were? They've been calling a lot recently, every single night. Tired fellow, is he behind the bush view there, Jean? Is he all right? He's biting his tail now. Well, that's probably an indication as to how he lost the end of it. in Egypt. Now, just before we go back to, I think you have, we're having quite a nice elephant sighting. Um, we'll just wait and see what these guys do, but why they do, while they do, we've got four names of male lions 
of what could be the same coalition, one of which is Scar. We don't know if that is the same famous lion Scar face that lost his eye and top and left, uh, sorry, right eyelid to a fight, and he was actually rescued as well by a vet because he was nearly killed by a herdsman. Now, we don't know if that's the same Scar that's in this coalition of four. It would seem to me that it most certainly is not. Um, because these guys have come in and killed the cubs that were probably Scar Faces cubs. Let's move forward a little bit. I'll just try and ease my way down here. And we'll shortly be going to the infrared, everybody. How's that, Jondry? And there you can see him covered in flies and full bellied. Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Now you can see his mane is a bit fuller than the Birmingham manes, and that's just like I say, a function of his age. It's not because he's any bigger, any more special in any way. It's simply that he is older. <laughs> you might just be able to hear the robins calling in the background. All those males are going to start calling at some stage. Oh, this fellow tries desperately to fight off the flies. We are also trying to take photographs, which we will post shortly. blurry because I've been taking them. Graham took a couple, so they should be fine. So night is falling beautifully. And it's just a real privilege to be out here at this time of the day. There's a gentle breeze blowing in from the north. Hello, Lynn. We did an experiment precisely for this reason to yesterday, and you want to know, do we think the lions will be comfortable with us at night, or do you think they won't be? Uh, you think they might be afraid? Lynn, we got some really nice stuff from them last night, and we followed them for quite a long time, and they were absolutely fine. They were just like Sabi sand lions. They went about their business, and they seemed to be completely satisfied with having us around. The other piece of equipment that we have with us here is something called a FLIR, uh, which is basically a thermal imaging camera, and it's an amazing thing. Jandre will just quickly show you uh, what is not, look, the most epic image you've ever seen in your life. But those white things there are the lions. They look like two white lizards. Two tropical house geckos, everybody. But what we will be able to see, of course, how this will help us immeasurably, is when we're following them on the hunt, we're not going to put white light on them if they're hunting. If they're eating or if they're clearly marking territory, then we would white light them a little bit. We don't have much white light here, but otherwise it's going to be the infrared and that quite interesting thermal imaging camera. Let's go back to them. It's almost time to put on the thermal imaging. And we're going to try, as far as I know, I'm just going to ask for confirmation here from Rebecca. Basically, we will only go infrared the same time as South Africa does. Is that correct? So it's a little bit lighter there than it is here. And so we'll just wait for it to get a little bit darker. There's a red eye dove in the background. That's one of my favorite calls. Let's just listen. Oh. 
obviously it's stopped now. Hello, Ashka. An interesting one about what effect that lion might have, uh, well, how his life might be different because he doesn't have his pom-pom. Um, you say, would it affect his ability to navigate and perhaps communicate at night with the other lions? Ashka, I didn't think so. I'm sure it would be a slight difference. I'm sure he'd be, um, it would be easier for him to be followed through the bush if he had it. I'm sure that it, I don't think balance would make any difference at all. It's largely a following mechanism. So for other animals to follow him, slightly more difficult perhaps, but I don't think it makes a huge amount of difference. And if you think about some of the animals, uh, I'm going to use the term maimed, that we've seen, that two-thirds trunk elephant, and we know that she's absolutely fine. That is such an insignificance in comparison. Alrighty, while the light fades in South Africa, let's head back to the elephants with Taylor.